Hey guys, welcome to the Hacked Existence intro to Pagers and Paging Networks. So in this video, we'll take a look at how to send a page to a pager, and that'll become the base for a larger video series where we'll do things like amplify that signal to get citywide coverage, take inputs to our pager network from a bunch of sources, things like voice over IP gateways, uh, SMS gateways, maybe we can do a DTMF decoder, take input from things like email and Twitter, and then send those messages out to our pager. Um, so before we go much further, let's take a look at it in action. So here I've got a pager. Um, we can see that there are no pages. So using the HackRF1 with the Portapack running the Havoc firmware, we'll go ahead and use the Poxag transmitter. Uh, and I've already pre-configured it with all the settings that are in this pager. So let's go ahead and send a page. And there we can see we've got a page that says Portapack. So we'll just go ahead and delete it. And now let's do the exact same thing, but this time we'll kick on the Baofeng. We can see here it's tuned to 421 megahertz, which is what our HackRF is transmitting at and our pager is receiving at. So we'll be able to actually listen to the audio that's generated from the RF. So let's go ahead and listen to it. All right, now let's jump over to the computer. Okay, so what we just heard was a POXAG message that was transmitted at 512 baud. POXAG basically supports three baud rates. So there's 512, 1200, and 2400. And the baud rate is basically the speed at which you're going to transmit the message. So what I have here is a video I recorded earlier of the GQRX using an RTL SDR. I'm basically going to receive three separate pages. They're all the exact same page but they have varying baud rates. So the first one will be at 512, the second one will be at 1200, and then 2400. So watch what they look like on the waterfall and listen to how they sound. Okay, so looking at the waterfall, we can see what changing the baud rate looks like. It's basically the difference between walk, jog, and run. It's just how quickly we're transmitting the message. And this is important because we have to transmit at the same baud rate that the pager decodes at. If we transmit at a different baud rate, the pager won't get the page. So from testing in my lab, I found 2400 baud to be pretty unreliable. Uh, 512 baud seems to be very reliable for me. It seems to work very well with the pager I have. Uh, but it seems to struggle with 2400, so I'm going to stick to 512 baud. So it's worth mentioning that one of the tools that I use in my lab is Multimon NG with an SDR, and it is capable of decoding all three baud rates at the same time. So if you're trying to debug or figure out what baud rate a message is running at, you can use Multimon NG to decode it. But again, if you're trying to talk to a pager, it's only going to be able to handle decoding one baud rate at a time. Okay, so now that we've covered baud rate, we need to take a look at bandwidth, and POXAG supports two distinct bandwidths. There is wideband and narrowband. So let's start by taking a look at what those look like. Okay, so in POXAG, narrowband is described as plus and minus two and a half kilohertz and wideband is plus and minus four and a half kilohertz. And what that means is if we're operating at a center frequency of 421 megahertz, placing a carrier signal two and a half kilohertz above that or 421.0025 megahertz gives us the equivalent of a binary zero. Now going two and a half kilohertz down from 421 megahertz, placing a carrier signal there represents a binary one. So at a baud rate of 512 baud or 512 bits per second, if we take one second on this waterfall, and remember our vertical axis is time, so it's about this much time, in that one second, we can transition or shift our carrier signal between a plus two and a half kilohertz or minus two and a half kilohertz frequency 512 times. So you can think of it like taking that one second and breaking it into 512 time slots and being able to transmit binary zeros or ones 512 every second. So our bandwidth is just the spacing from the center frequency of how far apart we put these zeros and ones. In narrow band, they are five kilohertz apart. In wide band, they are nine kilohertz apart. So this method of transmitting data is called frequency shift keying, or FSK, and this is probably the most primitive or basic version of FSK. This is binary FSK, where all we're transmitting is a bitstream of zeros and ones. 
So now that we understand bandwidth and baud rate, we can start to talk about fun things with frequency shift keying, like my favorite part of POXAG, the preamble. So at the beginning of a POXAG transmission, there is a preamble that is 576 bits long. Again, at a baud rate of 512, that's going to take just over a second to transmit. And that preamble is alternating zeros and ones. So this is the very distinct, very unwavering, very clear tone that you hear at the beginning of a POXAG message at all three baud rates. You can hear that tone right before you hear a bunch of chaos. And the reason that tone is uniform all the way through is because it's literally ones and zeros flipping back and forth to create the preamble of alternating zeros and ones. So that preamble, the reason it's my favorite part of POXAG is because it is one of those engineering marvels that you just step back and say, wow, because it's what's leveraged by pager hardware to make your the single AA battery last for months at a time powering a pager. Basically, if a preamble to a POXAC message is 576 bits long, the pager can power itself down and go to sleep and not provide all of its circuitry power for 574 clock cycles. Two out of every 576 clock cycles, the pager kicks itself on and pulls to see if there's a zero and a one or a one and a zero being transmitted. If there is, then it kicks on the rest of the electronics. It provides power to the receiver and the decoder and says, we're about to get a page, start decoding. Or it says, there's no page coming, go back to sleep. So if you line up preambles in a row, you only need to pull two clock cycles out of every 576 to know if there's a page coming that you're going to need to turn on and decode. And so this is how pagers actually operate. They stand in a standby powered down state most of the time. And that's why a AA battery lasts a really long time in a pager. So this guy in my research uses a pager very similar to mine. And people do this with all kinds of pagers. If you wanted to sniff all the pages out there uh, at a certain frequency, it's hard to do with a pager that sleeps most of the time. So people actually do physical hardware mods to turn off that polling so that they can leverage their pager as an antenna to listen for pages. Okay, so now that we understand that we need to begin our transmission with the preamble in order to wake the pager up and tell it to start decoding, the next thing that gets transmitted is the RIC or CAP code, and these are synonymous. They both refer to the exact same thing. It doesn't matter which one you use. I prefer to call it the CAP code. So the CAP code is a seven digit number that I like to think of more like a mailbox than a MAC address. And the reason is because while vintage pagers typically only support a single CAP code, more modern pagers like the one I'm using in my lab support multiple CAP codes. Mine supports up to six unique CAP codes. And basically what that means is that if I have a fleet of 30 pagers, in addition to having a unique cap code on every pager, I can also program in other cap codes that are shared between groups of pagers. So I can send a single transmission with a single message that gets displayed on multiple pagers, thus making it more akin to a mailbox than a MAC address that's supposed to be unique per every device. So while the cap code is seven digits long, there is an upper boundary on it. It's just under 2.1 million. So if you try to program a cap code of 3 million into a pager, it should reject it and tell you that that's outside of the namespace of what a cap code can be. Basically what this means is for our pager network, we can have just under 2.1 million unique mailboxes per frequency per baud rate. So when the pager decodes the cap code, it compares it to its list of internally programmed cap codes. If there is no match, then the pager immediately goes back into that sleep state and resumes polling for the preamble. If the cap code matches what's programmed into the pager's list of cap codes, then it continues decoding the rest of the message. The rest of the message is extremely simple. It's basically the binary coded ASCII value of the characters that you want to transmit. So you type out your message, convert it to ASCII, convert that to binary, and then use frequency shift keying to push that binary out over POXAG. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this introduction to POXAG and how to use frequency shift keying to push ASCII characters out to pagers over radio waves. In the next video, we'll plug the HackRF into a Linux box and get the GR Mixalot flow graph for GNU Radio Companion up and running. 
that'll basically give us a Python executable that will do everything downstream for us. So it will encode the message and push it out the HackRF, ultimately landing on our pagers. So stay tuned and thanks for watching.